Today our guest is Professor Andreas Thieler from Nottingham University and he is well known for his blogs for labor unions and the international uh, environment solidarity and uh, he, is, he is the author of several books as well and uh, now uh, early today we have attended a, a seminar at Westminster University they were discussing namely uh, Uber phenomenon and platform economies and this is actually immediately related to our uh, topic. Mr. Uh, Professor uh, Andreas will uh, take up the issue of trade unions between state, uh, nation state and global market and the issues concerning the international solidarity. Please. Excellent. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, uh, your seminar. So you can see the kind of trade unions between state and global market, the challenge of transnational solidarity. I think we are not too big a crowd, so if I sit, is that good? Yeah, or would you prefer me to stand? We've got this screen here. So, so the, the, the structure of the presentation is as follows. First, I'm going to talk a bit about what is transnational solidarity. I'm just going to have a bit of a kind of a grounding of, of what we're trying to talk about. I look then at globalization and the challenge for labor resulting from globalization. I look at possible strategies of transnational solidarity. I look at an experience from the Global South, where there's this trade union network, Southern Initiative on Globalization and Trade Union Rights, SIGTOR, and its Futures Commission trying to develop alternative proposals, uh, trying to overcome this fact that very often our struggles are defensive. What can we positively put forward as alternatives? How can we construct an alternative to neoliberal globalization? And then I conclude with a point what chances for the left, and that would be also very interesting for me to hear what, what, what you have to say uh, uh, about that. So coming to the, the first uh, uh, topic, what is transnational solidarity, I draw here on a book chapter by Ingemar Glimberg, which he contributed to this book on free trade and transnational labor. Ingemar Lindberg is a uh, now in his mid-70s, but he's a, uh, uh, has been working for, for decades for the Swedish labor organization before, and, and before that he worked as a state minister during the 70s in the social democratic government in Sweden. So he knows the, the labor movement well and uh, he says first of all solidarity between workers is based on mutual self-interest. It's, it's, it's not necessarily altruism. Altruism may come in, yeah, but it's basically self-interest. Uh, the main focus for workers and for trade unions as their organizing body is how to avoid that workers don't underbid each other in the search for employment. Yeah, because the result, of course, is this potential downward spiral. Yeah, I, I offer myself more cheaply, but then or somebody else may engage in exactly the, the, the same. So there's a mutual self-interest, but then he carries on and says, well, actually within a particular company, there may also be a mutual self-interest between workers and employer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Both want the company to do well in order to uh, uh, keep the, the production going, employment for workers, profits for the employer. So that in itself is not enough. There must be something else often than mutual self-interest. And his second point is that there's a common identity which results from the shared position in the organization of production. And of course, there's a difference. The employer owns the means of production. The workers, they have to, to sell their labor power. And so it's based on mutual self-interest. Solidarity from a labor perspective, but it's also based on a common place in, in the production process. But even that, yeah, we have to be careful, we don't want to have kind of determinism here, just because uh, uh, 
we are employed, employed in a particular workplace, that doesn't mean that uh, we share a level of solidarity with our fellow co-workers. And, and finally, would argue that solidarity is really created in action. It is the result of struggle. And so it's, it's the joint struggle when, when people recognize that despite of their individual differences, they have actually some fundamental common interests. And that ultimately then results in, in solidarity. So we can discuss that when we need to amend that definition of not, but I think it's a usual, it's a useful background uh, for our discussion here. So what are the, the challenges of globalization for labor? And in what way does that relate to these tensions between state and global economy? And I think very fundamentally it is useful to start by looking at what are the structuring conditions of global capitalism, whether it's in the period of globalization, whether it is previously. And the first emphasis is, is this focus on competitiveness. And that, of course, affects workers. I mean, you be competitive in order to get a job. You apply for a job, you are in competition with other workers for that job. But it also affects actually employers, yeah, because if you as an employer, if, if you don't retain your market share, if you don't increase your market share, you go under, you're pushed out of the market. So we mm -hmm. can just think about Nokia. Ten years ago, that was the mobile giant in the global market. Today, you can hardly buy a mobile, a, a Nokia phone. Yeah. Try, I think they try to relaunch themselves in a different fashion, but really, Nokia as such is no longer present. And it's really it's, it's cutthroat competition in the market, not just for workers but also for employers. So for the companies, as well. yeah, for the companies, yeah, no, for the companies as well, and that of course makes capitalism so, so dynamic. Yeah, because in order to survive in that competition, you constantly need to innovate. You constantly need to think about new products, new marketing strategies from an employer's point of view. And that, that gives a certain dynamic to capitalism, which other modes of production uh, uh, do not have. But of course, as a result of that, if you think about the structuring conditions, I would argue there's also a certain crisis tendency built into capitalism. And it's structurally, uh, it, it's the, the crisis it's, it's not because there are some greedy capitalists who want to earn ever more. Of course, there's a certain... They produce too much. Yeah, they, they produce too much in this competition at ever lower prices. And at some stage, you have a crisis of overproduction uh, with more goods on the market than actually people are present who can, can buy it. And then, of course, you, you have suddenly a decline in profit rates and... and bankruptcies and, and, and unemployment. But also, I think what we experience in this moment in time is actually a situation that's better described as a crisis of over-accumulation. Because in the global economy, there are enormous amounts of private finance sloshing around in the system, mm -hmm. trillions of dollars. And it's, it's not a shortage of money, but there's a shortage of prof profitable investment opportunities. Capital always has to invest the profit. Sure, sure good customers as well. Yeah. You, you don't put it under your pillow at home, your profit. Yeah, you have to reinvest to make more profits. And there's a lack of, of, of profitable investment opportunities. So actually big transnational corporations currently buy back the share, their shares on the market because that seems to be a better way of investing their money than engaging in activities. And I think partly also because of this lack of investment opportunities, you have this pressure on the public sector. Yeah, this, suddenly, if you privatize the NHS, that could be for this private capital a way of investing their, their surplus money. But we have this crisis of, of over-accumulation, and as a result of that, the, 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 the capitalist is, is driven towards this dynamic of 
outward expansion along lines of uneven and combined development. Yeah, this, this capital, how do you overcome a crisis? But you look for new markets, you look for cheaper labor to become yet more competitive, and you focus on recommodification of the public sector, yeah, the, the privatization. Yeah, that's also a way of, of expanding. Yeah, so certain, if, if you think about uh, the health sector, yeah, the, the way the National Health Service was established, the fundamental principles of the National Health Service was that everybody according to his or her needs. Yeah, if, if you had an injury, everybody was entitled to go to the doctor and for, for, for treatment. But the moment you do that, you take it out of the market. And privatizing that could be a way for capital to overcome this crisis of overaccumulation. So that's at a very general level, I would argue, the kind of structural dynamics inbuilt into the way because of how production is set up around this kind of private ownership of the means of production and free, in inverted comma, wage labor. And we are talking about those 200 years. Exactly. Last 10 years. Yeah. So, so it's much broader, yeah. but that, that's general. That affects capitalism in general. All these things is repeating itself. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. So what does that then mean in our current period of globalization, which I would see as a particular sub-period within uh, uh, capitalism as a whole? And on the one hand, what we have experienced, especially since the mid-1980s, is this increasing transnationalization of production. And here, of course, the rise of transnational corporations. And this was mainly fueled by the search for cheap labor in order to overcome the crisis in the 1970s, yeah, where we had this worldwide economic crisis. And how to, to, to become profitable again? Well, capital engaged in what some people refer to as a spatial fix. We moved labor-intensive parts of production to the global south, especially in the textile sector, where you had cheaper workers, and that allowed you to increase again your profits uh, by drawing on, on these cheap labor resources. And that provided, and that's where the tension comes in between the state and the global economy, that, that was a clear problem, has been a problem for trade unions, because in the post Second World War period, trade unions were mainly established and were at their strongest within the national setup. That's where all the bargaining structures in the global north at least were established in order to avoid that people in one particular country and <coughs> each other. But of course, suddenly, with this transnationalization of production, you've got competition between different labor movements across borders. And uh, workers here would not be able to compete with the low wages of Chinese workers. Uh, so in, in a way you could say Chinese workers are pitted against British workers. Uh, in in the, during uh, Thatcher years, when yeah. there was this minor strike here, yeah. uh, Polish workers produced more coal. Yeah. Even French and Germans yeah. have produced yeah. something. Yeah in order to break the strike here. Yeah. Mm. And this, so there's a lack of solidarity, yeah? and this is the question then, yeah? how can you replicate what you used to have at the national level? It was not always automatic, but even within a country, people were showing solidarity with each other. But that, that was where trade unions were the strongest. How can you reproduce that at the international level? So that, that's the, the first big challenge. But very closely related to that, especially more recently, in the last 10 years, what we have identified is that transnational corporations have increasingly become reluctant to own the whole production across borders. Actually, they are now subcontracting a lot of, of their operations. So Apple has Foxconn in China to organize the assembly of its various Apple products. And of course, that, that's actually, for Apple, that, that's a very good way because they don't need to bother with all the labor problems and with the organization of the shop floor. Yeah, they, they, they just put, uh, they give very low margins to Foxconn and, and they, they are more involved in the kind of branding 
and marketing of their products where there's much more profit uh, to, to be made. But of course for trade unions again, so it's not only difficult to organize workers along these transnational production lines, but actually when you have these global value chains in this fragmentation, how would you organize actually workers across that global value chain? Workers who are no longer even in one and the same company. Uh, the, 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 the challenge is yet becoming more difficult. And in the end, or beginning rather, if, if the beginning of the production is in China, yeah. for instance, or is India, for instance, yeah. or even South Korea, yeah. where there is, uh, there is a very limited trade union activity, yeah. Yeah. or no trade union activity, yeah. how on earth you Western workers going to compete yeah. with these countries? Yeah. And there's no chance. In, in, in China, you don't even have the right to free association. Yeah, yeah. You're not even allowed to form your own trade union. Of course, workers always try to organize. And they have these kind of informal labor NGOs, which sometimes function a bit at the local level in a way of organizing uh, uh, workers. Yeah, workers always organize. But of course, it's tremendously difficult, and there have been lots of crackdowns within the. Mm -hmm. In China. And of course, with all this fragmentation, there's also an increasing informalization of work, the, the spread of precarious labor. And actually, in the global south, this has always been the dominant thing. Yeah, I think there's a danger we overlook that in the north. But what we experience here now is when we have increasingly precarious labor. Uber, you mentioned it. Yeah. It's one of those things where the risk is totally devolved to, to, to workers, zero hour contracts. The UK is a perfect example of this increasing informality. And again, that makes it very difficult to organize. It makes it difficult to organize because if workers are constantly in the job, out of the job, doing another job there, rather than being in one and the same workplace, how, how can you actually ensure that, that, that they are becoming organized and mobilized within a trade union. At least our standard trade unions, they struggle with that. I'm active in my own trade union, the University and College Union at the University of, uh, of Nottingham. If you have increasing casualization with some people being employed for 10 months, we said, oh, how about joining the union for these and these benefits? The person says, well, I'm in 10 months, I'm out of, the, I'm out of here again. Yeah, what, what, what's the point? Become the joke. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so, of course, then it's our task to think about, okay, how can we support those workers on those short-term contracts meaningfully to get better contracts? So it's not impossible, but of course it's much more difficult as a result of, of globalization. And finally, I would argue that there's also this and that's interesting at the moment with Trump in the US and, and his bullish talk against those free trade agreements, but there has been a series of these expanded free trade regimes, TTIP, CETA, which is actually not just about the, the trade in goods, but also trade in services, public procurement areas, intellectual property rights. And that actually also results in a particular challenge for workers because, of course, different national labor movements find themselves in rather different locations within the global economy, and especially over free trade. Until very recently, at least, there used to be the position that export-oriented trade unions in the global north, the German IG Metall, uh, British Unite, uh, they were always in favor of these free trade agreements because they are fantastic. If it's easy or fast to export, to African countries, to emerging economies in Asia. Our companies are more profitable. The jobs of our members are secure. secure. Yeah. And, and the trade unions in the global south said, but hold on a second. If we agree on those free trade agreements, all our industries, which we are trying to develop, they collapse because at this moment in time, they can't compete with the more high productivity goods produced in the global north, and that there have been bitter divisions in the global labor movement 
over these expanded free trade agreements. So these are a bit the, the challenges workers are facing. But, there's a cause of however, I think we need to remember that the fragmentation of the working class, which we experience now, is nothing new. And there have always been divisions along ethnic, gender, and national lines. To bring in migrant labor to undercut workers within a country, that, that has happened in the 19th century in, in the German Ruhrgebiet, when there were strikes that brought in people from, from the East. And of course, there were tensions initially because the, the people in the war have been thought, I mean, these people are undercutting us. Yeah? Well, what's going on here? And again, as back then as now, solidarity can only be the outcome of struggle. Outcome of struggle, and it's always a possibility. Capitalism is crisis prone, and the expansion of exploitation is always contested, that needs to be remembered. So one has to be careful when we assess the challenges of globalization, that we don't reaffirm the power of capital, and that we also remember the fact that in this outward expansion it's always contested. There are always, and we know in Uber, we know in the other these kind of new platform economies. There have been attempts actually to, to organize these, these workers. And there are old but also new power resources. So some people would say structural power, marketplace power, workplace power, yeah? certain workers in the production line, that if they go on strike, the whole production breaks down. That has always been the case. Associational power, the strength of trade unions organizing has been there. Institutional power and tripartite relationships uh, uh, used to be there. Of course, those power structure, power sources are related to each other. And some people from, from Jena and Germany, they also speak about social power, the cooperation of trade unions with other types of actors in civil society uh, has been there. But so why these, these are powers with which trade unions know, I think that there are also new powers, people would point out. Some say symbolic moral power. So when we look at the kind of living wage campaigns, yeah, the way to mobilize for that is not necessarily to go and strike, that can be part of it, but it's in a way it's a naming and shaming exercise of the employer. There's this trade union united voices of the world. UBW in London, which has successfully organized cleaners in the Barbican Center, for example. Yeah, they, they shame that, that employer for their very poor practices in public, and that puts significant pressure on them, which moves them towards uh, uh, making uh, uh, concessions. And there's logistical power. The moment you have these transnational production structures, actually, a strike at only one link of those global value chains would, in one stroke, completely uh, uh, stop the whole production along these lines. So, while there are pressures, there are also opportunities for trade unions to, to, to organize in these difficult times. So, what are these possible strategies of transnational solidarity? And I think one, one thing one, one perhaps needs to do is to distinguish between the possibilities in different sectors, different industrial sectors. So perhaps in this tension yeah, between the nation state and, and the global economy, rather than thinking on the long national lines, perhaps we need to focus on different sectors when we think about different strategies. And one, one area is, of course, transnational manufacturing, car manufacturing, uh, the automobile industry, as an example. And here, perhaps, what is crucial is that, that the various trade unions organize across borders. And there have been examples with the General Motors plants in Europe, where there was a successful one-day strike organized in 2001 across those various General Motors 
uh, uh, production sites in 2001, which did prevent uh, at least compulsory redundancies in the new plant of Vauxhall, it's called the UK, uh, here in Luton. But of course, it's not automatic, and there's also the example of uh, 2014, but General Motors basically instigated a competition between its various European sites who was going to make the most concessions and they were then getting the new contract for, for building a certain model of that. that the English lost that. The English lost They have the only one the engine factory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was, was Polish workers at the time who said, well, we are so far behind. Mm -hmm. Cheap labor is our comparative advantage and, and then we can offer that. We also want to have production here. So it's not automatic, but perhaps transnational manufacturing is the area where cooperation between trade unions is essential. I would argue services is a slightly different issue. Yes, services is the area where you can have broader alliances in, in struggles, where you can bring together the users of the service with people being employed in the service provision. And in a moment I'm going to look at, at water privatization. I think this is an area where we have a whole range of examples where the trade unions organizing the workforce cooperate with user organizations and also environmental NGOs in the defense of, of, public, of public water. We have examples in the UK where there's an attempt to close down a local hospital and there would be consumer groups and, and the workers who cooperate in, in, in resisting that. And as, I think these broad alliances perhaps are more suitable for services rather than the car, the automobile industry. Another example are these, these large construction sites uh, after the unification of Germany in the 1990s, there were 90,000 workers working in Berlin on reconstructing the, 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 the center from all over the place, all kinds of different languages, very <coughs> difficult to actually find out, I mean, who is paid according to what, which contract. Different contracts. Yeah, different, I mean, it was difficult to establish in the first place. And there one could say, it doesn't make so much sense to say, oh, the German Construction Workers Union should cooperate with the Romanian Construction Workers Union and the Polish Construction Workers, because what was much more important was to organize all people in the, on the work side and to make sure that those who were there did not underbid each other. And that's not, in that respect, it was not so important to have a close cooperation with a trade union in another country but perhaps to have organizers who had the language capacity to approach those workers from different areas. So again, a different sector in these times of globalization requiring a different, a different strategy. And then when it comes to informal workers, perhaps we, we need different types of organizations. Perhaps our mainstream trade unions are not necessarily the right ones in their more bureaucratic structure to organize those new informal sectors. I've mentioned here StreetNet International which organizes street vendors in all kinds of countries around the world and supports them in their struggle with local municipalities to have some basic rights securing their, their particular trade. But I think if you look at the UK, for example, in the cleaning sector in London, it's, it's quite interesting. Again, the UBW, which, which organizes uh, cleaning workers often with a Latin American background, all workers that uh, have also organized a successful campaign with, with the, the, the LSE about, about conditions of cleaners that just, just recently or Topshop was also their target. And I think with this kind of new and flexible strategies, they have been much more successful in, in making gains for those <coughs> workers than perhaps Unison, which is this very large operation focusing on some big sectors, but perhaps not flexible enough 
to deal with the particular concerns of those kind of uh, uh, workers super exploited often working in the, in the cleaning industry. And so perhaps in relation to informal workers, we need to think about different types of organizations in order to organize them for successful resistance. This has been more general. I'd like to, to, to give two more concrete examples of successful instances of transnational solidarity. And the first one is this European Citizens Initiative, ECI, on water as a human right. And that took place between 2012 and 2013. Didn't have much traction in the UK. Perhaps we, we have already been so used to private water, yeah. but we don't question it anymore. Although if one looks at Thames Water, for example, yeah, and the scandals around that and mm. the profit they reap, um, we may have to rethink that. But it was actually successful across Europe. Within a year, a bit longer, there were more than one point, more than. I think one point, yes, 1.9 million signatures collected, which then forced the European Commission in a statement on water as a human right. And it's not just this European Citizens Initiative at the European level, but actually we've also have the experience of all kinds of local struggles, which not only manage to defend public water, so that water is administrated by public organizations, but which actually also secured a re-municipalization of water. So in 2010, the, the water service in Paris were, were re-nationalized, re-municipalized. And that led to a reduction in, in consumer prices of 8%, for example, the next year. Yeah, so, so in public hands, the, the charges are gen generally lower. In Berlin, Water was re-municipalized in 2013. In, in Thessaloniki, during, the, during 2014, people mobilized successfully against the privatization of water, despite all the pressure Greece is under. And I think, what, what, what are the reasons for why the European Citizens Initiative, but perhaps why water struggles have been so successful? Yeah, there are not many areas where one can say that this neoliberal restructuring, such as privatization, has been successfully contested. And on the one hand, it's the unique quality of water. Yeah, it would be generally accepted that it's a fundamental source of life. In the Italians, they had a water referendum against privatization in 2011. And it was also organizations such as the Catholic Church not known necessarily or blocked for its progressiveness, but large parts of it came very strongly out in support of those referendums because it resonated with the Catholic social doctrine. Yeah, so that the people on the center, people on the right, who would be perhaps fully happy with a neoliberal strategy, with marketization, but when it came to water, they said, no, no we can't. That, that's such a fundamental different type of, of good. This is not that we should, there should be nobody who makes a profit with water. So it's a unique quality. But it's precisely this kind of sector where there was a broad alliance of trade union social movements and environmental groups. And I think that, that shows a bit what I mentioned before. When it comes to services, it's much, it's perhaps. These broad alliances are useful going <coughs> forward. Now, trade unions supported the European Citizens Initiative because they know for well if water, if service become privatized, the working conditions deteriorate very often combined with job losses and also the pay uh, uh, is less good. Yeah. We know that. The moment the public sector functions become privatized, how do these private companies make profit? Well, they put downward pressure on workers' conditions. So trade union supported that citizen initiative against uh, 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 privatization. We had a whole range of environmental groups supporting it, such as Greenpeace, uh, uh, 
farming to bureau at the European level. And why would they do that? Well, they do that because there too is an understanding that actually the moment water becomes a commodity, environmental <coughs> concerns only take on a secondary role. Yeah, then the moment you have the profit motive dominating the provision of services, the environment loses out. So for environmental groups, public water is also something they would support for different reasons from trade unions, but it, it's something that they would feel strongly about. There were, and the Citizens Initiative also had that goal or the demand that the European Union should involve itself more actively in ensuring that not just in Europe, but actually that globally everybody had access to safe drinking and sanitation water. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of developmental NGOs also supported this particular European <coughs> citizens initiative. And finally, we had a whole range of social movements, citizens initiatives at the local level who were very aware of the fact that the moment the public water becomes privatized, very often the quality of water deteriorates and the, the rates of pay go up. And there are examples of uh, central Italy where there were uh, privatization of waters in the late 2000s. And the result of that was that partly the, the water costs, the bills went up by 100%. Uh, this is dramatic. Of course, the higher they increase, sometimes people are pushed to a level where they actually have the taps turned off. And we know that from Flint in the United States, where people can't pay any longer for the water bills, they have the water supply cut off. So again, social movements, citizens' organizations at the local level, very strongly, strongly involved in, in this campaign. And that, of course, also ensured the success that particular initiative. And I would say in relation to water and European Seas Initiative, there's a multi-scale dynamics of struggle. There's the global level, it's reflected in the alternative water forum, where different experiences were coming together for the first time in 2003, and where the European groups in Italy, for example, suddenly realized for well, a second what's happening in Bolivia and Cochabamba. Yeah, but, uh, we had these water struggles in 2000. Actually, Turkey. Turkey, yeah. yeah. Actually, what's happening there is exactly what we are confronting here, too. Uh, so we had all kinds of local struggles, the experiences which came together at the international level but which then also translated into national level efforts. So in 2006, the Italian Water Forum was founded, which then reached the struggle for the successful referenda in 2011 in Italy. So we had the local level, national level, we had the global level. In 2010, the United Nations adopted water as a human right, as a United Nations principle. And against the background of this, different struggles at the different levels. It was then at the European level that the European Federation of Public Service Unions initiated this European Citizens Initiative. How come the United Kingdom citizens didn't involve in this? They, I spoke to the, the General Secretary of the European Federation of Public Service Unions and they said we approach trade unions in the UK, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you need an institution which takes on and says, okay, we, we, we mobilize them on that. And ultimately, they failed to have somebody to sign up. Why, why was that? I, I think we would need to talk to the, the colleagues at Unison, for example. But I think it's, it, it's also due to the fact, A, that water privatization has been a fact of life for so long in the UK, and B, perhaps, that there are so many attacks in the UK 2012 13, the, the, the first years of the austerity budgets by the condemned government at the time, tax on the health service, that perhaps it was felt that they just did not have the resources mm -hmm. to involve themselves also in that particular campaign. But there were 13 countries which collected the necessary signatures 
for this initiative to be successful. Yeah, the European Citizen Initiative is a new tool at the European level where in order to push the Commission and the Parliament into adopting a position, you need to collect at least one million signatures plus achieve a certain quota in, in uh, uh, its seven countries and they have achieved the quota in 13. And that, that, that was successful and I would argue it's also due to those three issues and I think that's one example of successful transnational solidarity. Second concrete example, the Stop TTIP campaign. Uh, we had here participation by main trade unions, except for Scandinavian metalworking unions across Europe. I think there's a change even in the export trade unions in, in Europe. The IG Metall mm -hmm. in favor of TTIP. The TUC has adopted position as a whole to oppose TTIP. So Northern trade unions start changing their position on, on trade. One of the reasons. There were more than 500 participating groups. Again, trade unions, but also social movements, NGOs, which realized that, especially for example, the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, yeah, where companies can drag individual countries in front of some kind of ad hoc court in order to uh, uh, sue them for lost future profits, yeah, that they realize that that actually undermines drastically national policy sovereignty. And of course, ultimately, that there were different dynamics in different countries. So in the UK, it was the implied potential uh, uh, pressure of privatization of the national health sector, which brought a lot of people to support this stop TTIP campaign. In Germany, it was more the idea that you would have these chlorine chickens. Yeah, because it, the, the TTIP, of course, it's not just about trading goods, but it's actually about deregulation of existing health and safety standards. And in Europe, you cannot sell chickens, which you have to put into chlorine before you can put it safely on the shelf. Yeah, whereas in the US, the kind of production conditions of chickens are so horrendous that actually you can only eat it if the chicken was first dumped into some chlorine to disinfect yeah, and then, then you sell it. And in Germany the idea, that of course you deregulate, which means that what is considered to be safe in the US is considered that has to be considered safe here. Because if you had a special health and safety measure that would be considered to be a barrier to trade. And that was what TTIP was about. So in Germany, it was this idea that you would suddenly have the U.S. chlorine chickens on the shelf, which energized, energized, agitated a lot of people. So different things work in different countries. But again, I think this top T deep campaign is one example of a very successful uh, uh, alliance, of a very successful case of transnational solidarity. And TTIP has has been stopped. Uh, several countries said that they are not willing to engage further. And of course, with Trump now in the US, for different reasons, TTIP as such is, is not on the agenda anymore. And another example I want to, to give is, is the so called Futures Commission of the Southern Initiative on Globalization and Trade Union Rights. This is a network of trade unions in the global south. So you have the South African COSATO, you have the Brazilian CUT, you have the Argentine CTA trade union, you have the Korean KCTU. These are the most important members of this group. And they said, we don't only want to engage in defensive struggles. We don't just want to prevent the privatization of war, for example. But we want to develop concepts for alternatives to neoliberal globalization. And so this Futures Commission has published a report challenging corporate capital, creating an alternative to neoliberalism. It's freely available on the internet, and that includes concrete proposals, for example, on labor and tax justice. Yeah, how is it? But we still have these tax havens in the UK 
loses, some people estimate, 120 billion pounds per year in tax receipts because of tax savings. Proposals to what could a fair trade regime look like. There's a proposal towards a democracy-driven public sector transformation. Yeah, we need to make the public sector perhaps more efficient, but that doesn't mean to bring the private market in. We can also do that within the public sector with the support of the people who work and the expertise of the people who work in there, actually. And then there was also one proposal on labor's response to the climate crisis. And the idea is, of course, not that this future commission, consisting of labor academics and trade union researchers, puts forward proposals which are then adopted by a trade union. It's ridiculous. Yeah? You, you can't just have proposals and then impose them. But the idea was more, and that's how this booklet is conceived, to have a kind of an education resource, which is then used by trade unions to debate those issues. And then the outcome may be rather different from what is proposed. But the individual proposal are just a, a, a range of suggestions to lead to broad discussions so that those various participants of SIGDOR are able to develop a different kind of trade regime, proposals for a different kind of trade regime. So it's, it's the, the brochure is intended as a spark towards the development of alternatives. It's this idea, if you want to resist neoliberal globalization, capitalist exploitation, it's not enough <coughs> just to defend, but one also needs to have alternatives, a new vision. Yeah, some people would say, and I think correctly, that when the labor movement started, there was this socialist vision which informed trade union activities and mobilizations. And, and at this point in time, perhaps this vision is, is, is no longer that, that present in, in the labor movement. So this just as an attempt to, 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 contribute, to, to, to contribute towards moving towards this alternative. So but what chances for the left, as so I've outlined a range of course, so it's clear capitalist exploitation is always contested, but as I also said, there are new power resources available to labor movements. Yeah, there's no reason to be defeatist. And there are also examples of successful transnational solidarity, and we need to keep that in mind. And of course, that, that would be a very positive note on which to end uh, this presentation. And I've just come back from a two-day conference in Berlin, in Germany, where the Friedrich Ebert Foundation brought together, I think they had 26 case studies of successful labor mobilizing at the national level, at the international level. There was a case study, for example, on the first successful organization of the workers of a Starbucks in Argentina. Yes, the, the first Starbucks with an outlet with a collective agreement. Yes, so, so these kind of case studies were presented there, positive examples, very important. But over to today, over to today, with more and more of these case studies being presented, but we really feel a certain sense of almost kind of bullish feeling of success. And then there was one person who said, oh, globalization is no longer just a challenge, but actually it offers us opportunities. And it's, just, it's been changed over the last 20 years. I'm skeptical of that. And one colleague even said, oh, actually, it's labor now which shapes economic globalization yeah, on this head. And that then actually made me, me think, and it would be interesting to see what, 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 you, what, what you said. And I said, hold on a second. I mean, if we look at the state of labor at this point in time, yes, it is important there are new power resources. It is important there are success stories. No, no question. Uh, but actually, if we look at capitalism at this point in time, it presents itself almost as its most brut brutal. Yeah, I mean, we have super exploitation of workers in the global south. We have super exploitation of workers here. 
so and so many millions rely on food banks. Yeah, we probably know the film I, Daniel Blake, the benefit system and, and how it operates in, in this country. So, so actually at this point in time, capitalism shows itself in one of its most brutal phases. Of course there are struggles, but I think actually at the grand scale of things, labor is losing that struggle at the moment. If you think about political development <coughs> in Europe, the left has been unable, we have been unable to provide a convincing alternative. In Brexit, it was either you are for the neoliberal European Union, or you are supporting a kind of a xenophobic nationalist <laughs> position of UKIP, in France, you are either for the kind of social neoliberal Macron or you are in support of the Foreign National and Le Pen. There was a strike recently and Marine Le Pen was welcomed by workers at the picket line. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you look at the United States, not much hope there either for, for an alternative left position. If you look at Latin America, the successes of the Pink Tide in the 2000s are being rolled back. In Brazil, we had a coup like against the, the workers' uh, party government. In Argentina, we have now a neoliberal government after the years of Krokno. And even in Asia, I don't think we can identify a radical socialist alternative emerging. And so I, I think, so of course we need to look at the positive examples, but I think that uh, we also need a sense of reality that actually at this point in time it, it looks pretty dire. And, uh, that doesn't mean we should not struggle, we always <laughs> have to struggle. Yeah, but I, th I think it also indicates that despite the positive examples, to some extent they are drop in an ocean of conditions of, of super exploitation. But that's what I'm wondering myself at the moment. Yeah? And so, in, in that end, uh, how effective are we actually in view of those current challenges, in view of, of, of the current situation? And just to throw that out also as a question. And with that, I would be finishing that presentation. Which did I could is uh, stop myself. First, you mentioned two things. Lack of vision. Mm -hmm. Not only trade union level, but also workers moment level. Yeah. Second thing, when you said that uh, capitalism is so brutal, mm -hmm. it takes my mind to the, the 1860s, 1870s, how mm -hmm. it was. Um, two things um, going together in my mind right now. The third thing, uh, I recently watched uh, uh, Lenin on Train, two episodes. Uh, Europe, in the beginning of uh, last century, was in turmoil. And every place, every place in the continent, including the United States, uh, uh, reactionary, ruled by reactionary powers. Yeah. And today it's almost same. Yeah. There is there is maybe Venezuela a little bit. Even um, South America is South Africa is going down yeah. to mine everything. But I, we have to look for the opportunities. We have to look yeah. for the other aspects. Why? Then uh, it, I come back to the first point, lack of vision. Uh, you clearly explained how the capitalism were developing, how capitalism were recreating itself. But it also gives us opportunity to organize the workforce not only in national level, global level. And then one example comes to my mind in New York, the cyclists, bikers, mm -hmm. when they were united, they block the communication between the all 
companies yeah. and they, they would win. Yeah. And they were not speaking one language, they were speaking several languages. Yeah. Then it is also, that is transnational. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. can put that to Europe level, Asia level, Africa level. I think we have to discuss more on the vision. Yeah. More on the vision and how we're going to develop the vision, how we're going to focus on uh, the struggle. One thing is coming to my mind right now, the bureaucracy in the trade union, bureaucracy in the labor movement mm -hmm. is really stopping and pulling us back from yeah. that, uh, creating that vision. Yeah. 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 Did you finish? Yeah. Now we can start questions and answers. No, and sorry. comments. No, no, no. <laughs> can you also tell me your name? Yeah, uh, my name is Ali. Yeah. Uh -huh. I work for refugees and migrants. Uh -huh. uh, I, yeah. I used to be a trade union chair in textile. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, also, uh, <coughs> our, uh, there is no a good uh, example. We are, we are always uh, trying to uh, create a kind of utopia, mm -hmm. a favor of the socialist, so-called socialist system. Yeah. And we, we know about a little bit success in Cuba. But after Soviet Union disappeared, yeah. well, Venezuela is a terrible yeah. uh, example. So people hasn't got concrete uh, example of success of left or socialist yeah. movements. They don't get, that's why it, it affects working class as well. The second thing is uh, it, it, the, the capitalism. Uh, integrated in the governments. Government supports are very important. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, crisis 2008-2009 in Britain. I was working, for, uh, still working for NHS mm -hmm. at that time. They told us uh, if we spend 20 billion pounds, the problem will be solved. Mm -hmm. And one year later, crisis started. They said there is no money, but they find money 500 yeah. million mm -hmm. yeah. for TSP yeah. and other banks. And uh, it's, uh, also, they are trying to make people believe of if we go, the chaos will be starting. Everybody, uh, even including working class, trying to uh, keep stability. Mm -hmm. They don't. Uh, they really make a big fuss, big, big uh, fear about if stability is a problem. Yeah. Think about world. Mm. And uh, also, unfortunately, people agreed on uh, that some people spend more. Think uh, what's going on in Middle East and all Africa. There are some people who is in uh, you know, the prosperity, living in prosperity, and other people has to be spendable. Yeah. This is the a kind of racist approach mm -hmm. becoming politi politics in yeah. developing countries. Yeah. This, these four points are very important <coughs> challenges yeah. as well yeah. in front of the uh, working class or socialist movements. Yeah. Very effective. Yeah. I, I would agree with those. I think, especially your false point, or what, what I think, with neoliberal restructuring, so it's, it's about privatization, it's about deregulation, yeah. and all these kind of things. But I think what is also being quite important is, but it also changes us ultimately as individuals, mm. in the sense that we, we do become society becomes more individualistic. And that, of course, then yeah, can contribute. Yeah. yeah, that can then contribute to a situation where other people become expendable. Mm -hmm. And I think since the 1980s in this country, also with such a that that has a bit, so it's a huge challenge for us people growing up now in this society. You are got very different kind of stimulus from from. Maybe I will talk a little bit too much, but. I, uh, we are fighting uh, with local cancer to bring more Syrian refugees yeah. 
Like when they come to 25 families or 100 people, yeah. so about two years ago, they only accepted three families. That's yes, correct. Yeah. And let me just start talking about their side. We couldn't find decent homes for them. Yeah. We said, okay, we've got four decent homes for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Grants are uh, much lesser, uh, less than market prices. Mm -hmm. We sorted out this problem with churches or mm -hmm. some landlords. And still they have fine excuses. Yeah. And then they say, okay, they, they can stay there for, for a while. I, put, yeah, it, it, I openly criticize the mayor of uh, Hackney. Yeah. Said, Look, they are bombing there. They are dying. They are children. He's like a statue. Not moving. Not going to move. And I think in the the very bottom of the their dark heart thinks they, they think this people spend it. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Just trying to save their own yeah. life or something like that. Yeah. Okay, number two. We take your first uh, turn for no uh, non speakers then afterwards we can talk more. We have quite a lot of time actually. You raised quite a number of points that I want to contribute to the mm -hmm. first question actually. Without forgetting, I must say that my question will relate to the state. Yeah. And what my contribution is as a start. Um, when we say capitalism, then the people attack and say, now is we are in a different era and uh, you know, they were uh, managing the economy or some sort of of course you can say capitalism is the capitalism and it is really doing this and that. At the same time when we are discussing neoliberalism, uh, as you did you to put precisely what changed. And uh, because uh, there are quite a number of things that I think we need to concentrate on thinking about it. I listened to the lecture by the late uh, Ernest Mander. Okay, yeah. And uh, he said uh, capitalism cannot manage with two type of uh, surplus value production. Mm -hmm. uh, relative surplus labor and the uh, absolute surplus yeah. labor production is not enough for them. Now there's a different type of surplus production, which is excess surplus mm -hmm. production. It is absolutely in the middle of it. What stands is the innovation. Mm -hmm. I mean, explain about how the innovation is used. In reality, in an individual capitalist, if he bought some plain for production uh, and innovative something, uh, either can put in the drawer, uh, it, or put it into production. And then, because of the copyright, and especially more and more developing the inte intellectual production as being the monopoly yeah. uh, by the capital, yeah. uh, it is very lucrative, because whatever the uh, years, let's say 15 years, for example, mostly 15 to 25, yeah. This company will make the enormous amount of profits. And also, when we look at the um, neoliberal economy, I think we can't divide in the neoliberal economy, globalization, no, let's say like that. Not because there's a neoliberal economy, we are global, globalization, globalizing. Because production process gradually took place in the uh, entire globe. So it is a uh, globalizing. Some people say, oh, no, no, it's not globalizing. Of course, it's not globalizing the way that we want. It's globalizing as neoliberal capitalist globalization. So it is a different issue. We are against it, but the, there is a globalization. The, the production process. Another point is, Crisis. Uh, I think when we are discussing anything, we need to put into the middle what this crisis is all about. As you, you mentioned and you said it, 
that all production or uh, other aspects brings the crisis. Yes, we need to look at it. In everything we are looking, yes, there is this crisis, and this crisis is pushing more and more, and that this situation come out. It is sort of a situation that there is even social production is in danger, as you were speaking about the climate change, mm, yeah. and water, uh, privatization of water, yeah. uh, and uh, the wages. Uh, there is a Gini index mm -hmm. uh, which shows how the inequality is yeah. mm -hmm. uh, increased in all yeah. amount, as well as the despite the direct uh, uh, capital movement is increased and its profit is even made, yeah, yeah. but is not distributed through through the channels. It's on the contrary. It's always becoming in the few people's hands, and the financialization and uh, centralization is affecting the state, is affecting the law as well. I mean, uh, a complex issue, you need to look at all, all these aspects. This social reproduction, the danger of the social reproduction, either a biological or um, reproduction of the labor force, including the education and the um, tra uh, training, train the workforce, etc. And uh, also caring aspects of the human being, let's say, forget about the workers, but the yeah. entire mass people. Uh, it makes more urgent, the issue has become more and more urgent. Uh, we feel every day, we feel the heaviness every single mm. day. So, therefore, I think we need to look at what's happening on the one hand, by knowing what the uh, what the suggestion will come out from this conference, from that seminar, from this little or big um, issue, uh, did they make a mistake or not? Uh, because it is a big opportunity for us. There is creating an alternative would pass through that. Mm. But it is becoming slow development. Maybe it is accelerating, but at the same time, what I see is a slow, slow development. Yeah. I was working with War on Want. Uh, yeah. I War on Want in uh, 1986, 7, 8, I think. And uh, translating one uh, beyond the pain, cleaning workers. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, in Turkish. I, I don't know whether they could uh, publish it. Um, it was eye opener. It was very important, especially important for the migrant population because ninety nine percent of the cleaners were migrant yeah. population from the migrant population. And uh, but at the same time, another researcher was making. I'm speaking about nineteen eighty two, doing one research on agribus agribusiness. Mm -hmm. There's another one was doing on Mac, McDonald's, yeah. and I think he published it, and uh, McDonald's gave him to court. Yeah. And uh, another one, which, is, which was eye-opening for me, mm -hmm. because I am coming from the Marxist Leninist tradition, mm -hmm. whatever you say, is a very, um, how can I say, official type of organizing, uh, hierarchy, etc., if you name it. But uh, this guy made, um, a research on Prelli, and the Prelli, uh, they intended to bring the Prelli trade unionists here, but not the uh, wishy-washy ones, but the militant ones, mm -hmm. and have a discussion around the uh, research. I mean, that was, I said, I was awesome. I said, wow, this is not like having an international uh, bureau or whatever, yeah, yeah. but it is yeah, actual yeah. field, yeah. people getting together. At the same time, uh, working in the migrant uh, issue, I was dealt with the trade unionists, for example, when I put forward the trade unionist uh, unionization of the migrant workers, migrant workers were absolutely not unionized, they were working in the cleaning, catering, and yeah. uh, garment industry. Yeah. And these were not unionized, yeah. so I, I put in lots of efforts 
yeah. bringing the black workers and getting hand in hand because yeah. they were really nice. At that point of time, I got the threatened. Uh, I'm threatened by the trade unionists. Mm -hmm. They said, we can put you into blacklist. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? They said, they said that we have a blacklist, you can't do anything or whatever. I said, do put, put, put into the blacklist. OK, there's no problem. Uh, what I see in that point of time, there was a great difference between the community organization's approach, which is very mm -hmm. new, which yeah. is very fresh, very mobile, very flexible. But at the same time, the trade unions were like stone, cannot be flexible, cannot yeah. be this, cannot be that. That is a danger. So it needs to be changed, and I'm pretty sure it is changing. But also, in order to change that, there need to be, from the bottom up, some initiatives to yeah. go and uh, get into the dialogue with the trade unions and change that structure as well. Um, there's other, uh, I know you are going to, but uh, there, there's other, other, other uh, issues that uh, we need to discuss, but I am giving great importance what type of uh, issues are put forward, like Washington consensus, but at the same time, what about the um, pecking consensus? I mean, I, I know, but I don't know the, the, the content. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need to know in order to see the entire getting together, how we are getting together. Mm -hmm. uh, what will happen if we are not very well aware, but I'm, I spoke about the 1986, and now it's quite a number of years past, mm -hmm. and we are not really made a great advancement, mm -hmm. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. My question now, this was my contribution, but my question is, I don't know whether I didn't catch it, we didn't discuss much about the state, because in the neoliberal uh, era, state also changed its mm -hmm. composition and mm -hmm. its format. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very important, because it seemed to me that it become uh, more and more security issue, the state yeah, is not yeah. anymore uh, even considering about its legitimacy. Uh, it has become a part of the uh, transnational companies. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. I would be happy to hear more about that. Thank you. Sorry about uh, speaking long. First time speakers, please, if you have any questions. Uh, I'm Mikhail. Um, well, thanks very much, first of all, that uh, you share your opinions with us. Um, you also uh, gave two unique examples about transnational solidarity in the workers' labor movement, yeah. uh, which is good, actually. But I would like to hear if there is some more examples of mm -hmm. similarity, or same yeah. uh, examples, uh, which one successful ones, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, what do you think about uh, why this labor solidarity, transnational labor solidarity, is not uh, good enough or as much as like capitalist globalization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any some reasons? Could yeah. be some reasons like we can say because there are some barriers between mm -hmm. Uh, countries to countries, nation to nations, or some uh, state regulations, laws, always uh, probably it stops the transnational solidarity, solidarity yeah. to improve. But there is no uh, such uh, uh, barriers in capital or neoliberalism, mm -hmm. uh, globalization. So. There should be difference, mm -hmm. obviously, the consequence of this. There should be difference about the level of the capitalism, global capitalism, and also labor movement globalization. Yeah. Um, so, another key point it should be in this uh, globalization for workers uh, movements or labors. Uh, key organization I think should be the trade unions. 
And if there is transnational um, solidarity between the trade unions, so this could bring the automatically, or it should be actually on this way, uh, transnational globalization between the labor movement as well. Um, is there any, I mean, uh, big issues or reasons why this doesn't happen and why it's so slow? Yeah. Please. Um, yes, my name is Sylvia Paul. Um, I thought what you said was very interesting. Um, I'm just wondering whether we also need to look at um, various changes which have taken place. For instance, um, I believe now the, um, the majority in the world are involved in, um, what should we say, the working class. The working class is now a majority yeah. over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly if you look at countries like um, China and India, yeah. there are massive numbers of workers. Um, you did say there wasn't much happening in China. I think we don't hear about an awful lot of the things that are happening in China, but there are a huge number of strikes that uh, are taking place there. And, and also the workers there have actually um, pushed up the wages quite significantly, yeah. so that um, it, you know, it's not quite so clear that things are, are, are cheaper there. Yeah. Um, and I also was questioning um, you talked about how sort of right-wing regimes had taken taken over in many countries. Well, I, on the surface, I think that's true. But I think you could also argue that um, in some cases, it's actually, if you like, partly a desire for change and, and partly um, looking at the traditional parties and, and saying they're, they're no good, yeah. they're not giving me what I need. You know, I'm, I'm suffering. So in America, for instance, you had um, the Sanders campaign, which was hugely popular, where yeah. people in America were actually prepared to call themselves socialists, etc. Yeah. And in fact, Trump, in a way, won on the same kind of ticket, because again, he was suffering yeah. something different. And, and yeah. similarly, you could argue even in France, with the, um, you know, Mélenchon is very popular, yeah. Yeah. so on. Um, so, um, it seems to me that there are a lot of um, sources of hope. I think it might be um, interpreted that, that capitalism, the reason why it's, it's being so brutal is because actually it is very much in crisis and so threatened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that really, um, I think, um, so sort of Comrade over there was talking about things like the trade union bureaucracy. And mm -hmm. in many cases, um, there have been movements of um, the grassroots workers. Um, I'm thinking of um, some campaigns in this country to do with them. Um, blacklisting and yeah. construction yeah. industry, um, some very interesting and innovative tactics going on. Yeah. So, you know, I think there are, there are a lot of, if you like, small signs yeah. of hope that perhaps yeah. we just need to kind of help to join them together. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I am the man. Uh, I just would like to know about to self-employment, for example, in nowadays, which is really popular to liberalizing. And in the case of self-employment, if we are thinking about this, do you think is there any chance to add for them to attend the struggle or mm -hmm. to be in the solidarity? Yeah. Because it is quite a different, as you mentioned, there is no place there for them to workplace yeah. the common and also yeah. they are really individual for the whole level of the processing, the labor processing. Yeah. That's why. Thank you. And I have a question. This I have. Now, I am a UNITE member. When I attend the UNITE meetings, American unionists are coming to talk. When I attend health and safety conferences, they invite the American speakers. Mm -hmm. I have asked them several times, why do you look at Americans? Why don't you look at the Germans, French, Italian, East European, whoever? Mm -hmm. Because they, you are European. European. Mm -hmm. It was the before Brexit, actually. 
So you should invite more IG Metal people or CJT people or Italian uh, unionists here because you need to be part of the yeah. European labor movement. Well, they say, well, uh, Americans represent what is going to happen to us. That is why we need their experiences. It is just crazy explanation, but I know that the union uh, lab labor movement is not actually looking more to Europe yeah. than they are looking at yeah. Americans. I don't think Americans have lots of things to teach European unionists, given the class struggle of many hundred years in this, in this continent. Now, that is one question. And secondly, uh, I've been reading some about Industry 4 in uh, German and Austrian uh, resources. Now, when they talk about, they talk about a certain type of worker who knows a lot, who is educated and trained, retrained a lot, and who can uh, administer the production process. Now, that is different than what we had to uh, witness many, many years. It is the first time we have a type of worker <coughs> who is going to stand and inspect mm -hmm. the whole process. Yeah. Actually, maybe it is the first uh, lights for communist workers, mm -hmm. maybe, for the future. Uh, but the, when it comes to solidarity, we don't have any solidarity between those workers and let's say workers in China because they are competing with each other. German worker is more for Bosch workers than uh, comrade of the Chinese workers. Because if the Bosch invests in China, then the German yeah. worker will be yeah. in a precarious situation. Yeah. Mm, that is uh, one thing. Uh, mm. I think you can uh, give yeah. us some answers yeah. about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> one more thing. Also, you, you, you said Chapters are very dynamic, mm. and uh, the trade unions are dissolving all over Europe, not all over Europe, all over the world. Mm. How many uh, members of the union uh, 30 years ago? Now, maybe only 30% yeah. of them exist. And uh, I remember the, when I was working with the trade union, uh, I was trying to persuade to take them to industrial tribunals. Maybe uh, there were cases, 50, 60 cases, very straightforward cases to be won. But only one or two they take on order. They are just, just relaxed, lazy at that time. And still, they try unions. Trade union yeah. the, uh, workers yeah. uh, working over there is uh, going to take the uh, cases to the industrial tribunal or chase a big ACAS or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, they don't do it. They, they, they didn't do it, that's why I learned how to do it. Mm. <laughs> and it, uh, I worked as a employment rights uh, advisor for 10 years until okay. they closed it. Uh, and th that's why uh, also they are finding new ways. Recently, uh, two, two years ago, government started a uh, volunteerism. Everybody must be volunteer to do something. Mm. I have 30 volunteers, I'm a volunteer manager. And there are people working free for us, mm. but with the hope of they are going to find a job. Yeah. I'm realistic, I'm showing them, look, you got very small chance to learn, but conditions very high. For example, for this job, 140 people applied in two weeks' time. Yeah. And also, apprenticeship, mm. work placement. Uh, forced working, if you are uh, on benefit, yeah. you got to work somewhere for one pound per hour. 
to, or they want to get a complete yes, sure. benefit. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. type of things, capitalism is itself a barrier in front of trade unionism mm -hmm. or organizing in trade unions. A trade unions themselves say they are not, a, they are not fighting, they are not active enough or radical enough or something like that. So the, the, in, within the countries there are serious problems. How can these trade unions will, uh, become, uh, will be organizing internationally? Mm -hmm. They yeah. cannot solve their own problems in, within the country. Yeah. Second round, you can continue no. asking. The, the please, if you're talking, would you like me to respond to those? Please. It's a large range of um, <laughs> yeah. important points raised. I, I don't think I, I can respond to all, but a, a, a couple of, 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 uh, of, of comments. I, to your first intervention, I already agreed with you basically yeah, at the very very beginning and then when you spoke about yeah, this four, very four points. the four points yeah I, I would agree with that and especially the kind of egoistic outlook yeah i think it's part of that that restructuring too it's incredible how few people the uk takes in such a rich country uh, and no justification to, to, to promise to take 25 families and find only three in the end. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. But I think it's replicated in other parts of the country too. I thought, I, I thought, the, I thought the very, very interesting points you made, and you referred to Ernest Mandel, and he said it's not absolute and relative surplus value, it's not enough in, yes. in itself. A very similar point is also made by people such as Sami Amin who speak about this kind of imperialist rent yeah, where in this, in incorporating workers in the global south in these transnational production structures actually that there's a third form of, of surplus value but you actually press workers below even the level of subsistence yeah, through brutality and, and open faults yeah, below the X minimum, existential minimum, yeah, I think that goes in a similar direction, yeah, so, so just, just to, to mention that. Picking consensus, there are some people who would have a big hope China is an alternative. I think if one looks at how China operates in, in Africa, often bringing its own workers, if you see how Chinese workers are employed in, in lots of factories in, in southern China, I'm, I'm not so convinced that there's such an alternative. I think it's a more, the state has a more active role in China. Yeah, it's not a liberal laissez-faire state, it's more active involved in the economy. But there's, there's a good, good book by, by somebody called Ben Selvin who's, who says whether it's the, the liberal uh, uh, free market state or whether it's the kind of developmentalist state. In both cases, it's always at the expense of workers. Exactly. Yeah. So, yes. so in, in that sense, yes, there, there is a different state strategy in China, but I'm not confident that that, from a worker perspective, is a positive alternative. I think it is crucial. Maybe it is one to one, but I yeah. want to just ask a few more questions. I think we. Yeah. as progressive people we must understand what do we mean by global globalization yeah. what do we want yeah. but not on the sense of ideology or uh, yeah. concepts yeah. it's actual calculation as well I mean mm -hmm. what do you what do, do you want do you want this sort of uh, Organization, mm -hmm. the spaghetti bolognese, and this, that, you know, yeah. we need to make a decision on yeah. that. Because yeah. when you, the whole world is developed, the whole world is using this sort of, yeah. this, this amount of things. What about the resources? We need to think about all this. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think yeah, they, these are the, the, the key concerns. Yes. And, 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 and I think people try to discuss that, but, but actually to, to bring that out more widely yes. and, and into discussions within the labor. That's what SIPTO tries, I mean make proposals, but the hope is really that it's also being discussed then in the labor movements and then that that's a big this is a big challenge. You also refer to the changing role of the state and I, I think you're yes. right of course from a from a welfare state, there has been this transition to a much more kind of a, of a, a, a neoliberal state, uh, which uh, on the one hand has deregulated, but on the other hand has imposed much more pressure on workers. And some people at the moment actually talk about precisely because of the crisis of capitalism, that we see the emergence of a kind of an authoritarian neoliberal state form, yeah, such as in Greece where from the outside you impose this kind of restructuring and you impose it by force because you know you could no longer get a majority in, in elections for this kind of cause. Or the way of how people in the benefit system here are forced is much more direct open oppression of, of people than, than in the past. Can we also say that since Soviet Union is no more, mm -hmm. there is no urgency to show that yeah. this capitalism is welfare yeah. capitalism like you. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, in that sense, is it uh, correct to say, uh, talk about neoliberal policies? I think, I believe that. Uh, neoliberal, whatever neoliberal is, yeah. capitalism itself. Mm -hmm. When there is nobody to say stop in front yeah. of them, yeah. that is what they are going to do. Right. So this should be an example to labor movement yeah. that if they don't say stop, yeah. that will be even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, today we were discussing about uh, platform economy, mm -hmm. which is uh, showing that it is very, very negative in many yeah. senses. But if these Tories make a landslide in this election, there is a possibility that they can have a landslide victory. If they do that, then they will change all health and safety laws, yeah. they will change all the employment laws, they will just prepare the conditions for soft Trans, uh, tr soft uh, tr transition to American way of doing things, fire and hire. Yeah. Uh, that is I am very yeah. uh, afraid of. That's the danger we have, and I think your point about yeah. the Soviet Union goes back to what you previously said, Ali. Yeah. 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 That, that without that alternative, and whether it was a real alternative or not, but there's no longer a pressure on capital here to show some some positive aspects vis-a-vis -vis something something else and that has weakened. Yeah, there is no role model. <laughs> There's no role model. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that may, makes it yet again much much more difficult. I think you, you mentioned the, the need for more examples. That's good. I mean there, there are more more examples and that was where I was at the, the conference in Berlin. Yeah so they, they collected and actually, if one goes on the website of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, they call it, they're going to publish short summaries of those 24, 26 case studies of successful organizing. So there was one case study, very interesting one, on Uruguay, where the trade union managed, in cooperation with the government since 2005, but also still independently, to have a very strong pro-worker position and they're still holding on to that. So that, that was an interesting example. There was this example of organizing Starbucks successfully. There was an example of a successful organizing of transport workers in Turkey around UPS. Hmm. Uh, so, so that was discussed. I think there, there are, there are uh, positive examples. I just think we need to, to place them within the wider the, the development and, and, and 
So we need to have them as an inspiration. But I don't think necessarily that then means, as one colleague said in Berlin, that labor is now determining how economic globalization unfolds. Uh, I don't think we are currently in that we should, but I don't think we have the power at the moment to do that. It's just uh, several, uh, there are several uh, uh, signs politically. For example, the elections in Holland, the government party, they were as big as a government party, the uh, workers party or whatever, PPR they are, uh, they have received now 6%. And the French Socialist Party's presidential candidate got six and a half percent. So they are thinking that the labor is going to have less than 28 percent, maybe 14 percent in England. So if this happens, this is uh, uh, what you call the catastrophe line. We don't know what happens in Germany or Italy, but the, the trend doesn't show anything positive as far as I can see. You also mentioned why is transnational solidarity not more present in contrast to capital. And I think when, there's one danger that we perhaps exaggerate how much global capital is unified. There's of course also competition anyway as a system, but there's also tensions yeah. over the Iraq war. There were big US transnational corporations, Coca-Cola, who tried to prevent the US going its own way because they said it leads too much con to too much conflict with other countries where, where we operate. Yeah, so capital is not that unified. But nonetheless, for trade unions, I think it has been more difficult to organize transnationally. And capital, of course, also uses the, the kind of division into different states globally to put worker movements against each other. Yeah. That, that's also one way of, of uh, uh, exercising control. Having said that, traditionally, if we look at the UK, people in London perhaps felt similarly far away from people up in the north at the Scottish border, yeah, as perhaps people in Italy would feel nowadays from, from, from the UK. So it's not that it's automatically with a country, it's all homogenous, that took some time to establish, and so potentially it could also be at the global level. At the global level, I think the problem is that so few workers are actually formally in trade unions. A tiny part, actually, of the global of the global workforce. And then there are this, there's the International Trade Union Confederation, and there are also this global union, the GAFs, Global Union Federations, yeah, the ITF, International Transport Workers Federation. And these are important institutions which try to forge these links of solidarity. ITF quite successful. When one talks to people in there, sometimes there's still a problem that trade unions from the global north sometimes seem to dominate the ITUC, for example. And there's perhaps still too much of them telling, oh, we know how things go. We teach you in the global south what you should do. And that's being resented. Yeah, so when you go to Kosato in South Africa, they don't want to be lectured by the German DGB or the British TUC how they should organize. And actually, very often, the Global South, they are much better at organizing informal workers because they've always been confronted with that. We could learn from them. Sorry, the last one. Which you... This is the Degebe, the TUC. Alman Degebe. Alman Degebe. Okay, thank you. I have just there one more question. Could it be possible that, for example, the third world, well, let me say, less developed countries yeah. like China, India, uh, Turkey, uh, Thailand, they do not oppose globalization. Why should they? Mm. Because 
the, with the globalization, the global shift, all mm. the manufacturing industries, mm. which are too expensive to hold in the uh, Western mm. world, are pouring there. Yeah. Thailand has become a real uh, hub yeah. of auto factories. Why should they be against yeah. globalization? Whereas the yeah. English workers here in Newcastle, they say they are against it because all the works go to somewhere yeah. in uh, India. Yeah. So that is also uh, one of the factors that yeah, yeah. Indian un unionized Indian workers mm -hmm. does not solidarize with the Newcastle yeah. Union member uh, in England. Be yeah, wise, Can I just ask something? Um, I was interested when you said that, um, Ismail, because um, in fact, I think in some cases the Indian workers are actually losing work because it's being sent to even cheaper yeah, um, labour markets. Because yeah. um, I'm very interested because I'm actually um, researching um, offshoring pu working publishing from oh, this okay. country yeah. um, where it's going to places like India and, and also the Philippines yeah. and, and how the unions are dealing with that. Yeah. Uh, and the answer is, I think, so far anyway, not very well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but it's also interesting because, you know, do you say, well, obviously we want to keep our jobs here, yeah, yeah. Um, so therefore we don't want the work to go there. Yeah. Do we help the, the workers in India organise themselves? Mm -hmm. Because that means that their wages will increase and maybe yeah. not so much work will go. Um, yeah. What about the quality of the work? Because mm -hmm. there, are, there are differences there. And, you know, I think it's yeah. quite interesting how different sectors yeah. organise. And in India in particular, where I've started um, just reading, researching, mm -hmm. um, it seems that a lot of the unions, or kind of proto-unions in some cases, organise, they actually do things like publicity campaigns and putting pressure on employers you yeah. know, in informal ways. It's yeah. quite interesting. Yeah. So I think it, it also relates back to your first question, yeah, where mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to say that there's nothing happening in China, mm -hmm. but there is no official right to free associations. Mm. Workers are not allowed to form trade unions, but despite of that, they have these informal labor NGOs which mobilize workers. And they have a whole range of enormously big strikes mm. for, for better working conditions. Mm. And there, there's a tension within the international labor movement because some argue we need to relate to the old ACF or China Free Trade, what was in the, I think it's the old China Free Trade Union, they're, mm. they're called the official trade union in China, but which is actually a party related mm. state trade union, it's not a trade union, mm. what we mm. would understand, mm. yeah, but th there's a temptation because they, they have more members than the ITUC <laughs> as, as such would, would master, so we need to cooperate, whereas others would say no, 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 we, we need to cooperate with proper trade unions which have the right to free association and therefore we should support those workers who try to struggle for those fundamental ILO labor rights mm. as a way then to overcome the problem as you say that there is this kind of, of competition. So it's not a matter of saying oh we should resist globalization, the Newcastle workers and why so we shouldn't tell the Chinese, oh, you should resist globalization, but what one would perhaps as a first step at least is to say that they also should have proper labor rights to organize themselves, to engage in collective bargaining, and to, to level the playing field a bit. And Chinese workers themselves want that. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be one step of, of coping with it better. With this, this, this kind of competition between different locations. But there are political problems in what you describe mm -hmm. now. Now, if the world economy is globalized economy, and if there is uneven development mm -hmm. in capitalism, and if the uh, manufacturing jobs, uh, wages are falling down mm -hmm. comparatively in the Western countries mm -hmm. and the jobs are going to the other side there is a, the other side of the picture as well since there are more jobs here and more wealth more benefit yeah. more welfare the workers 
with the aspirations move this way. Yeah. So, uh, logically, one should say, open the borders. We do not mm -hmm. want fortress Europe, fortress yeah. Britain. Yeah. When you uh, voice this, a trade union person would say, what are you talking about? Yeah. We can't open the borders. We want Brexit. That is what happens now. Yeah. They don't want, they want Brexit because they don't want, mm -hmm. uh, the, when they saw the, that 800,000 people came to Germany, mm -hmm. they said, well, this is just push the panic button. Mm -hmm. uh, they are going to come here. We don't want them. But not every is, trade unionist would say. No, not, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but there is a uh, sort of uh, trade union people become uh, sort of allies with their own state against yeah. the foreign workers. Yeah. Uh, that is a funny combination, actually. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of the labor intensive industries mm -hmm. in his inner time. Uh, and the global economy with Reagan and the earth in between very speedily developed yeah. and established. Uh, basically, there was no job because all the North countries of Britain, um, Birmingham, Sheffield, steel industry, mm -hmm. Shipping industry, yeah. all gone, and a, especially the Asian workers on the uh, garment industry in the Midlands. Yeah. So we, what we see, this is the people don't know, uh, male population went down, mm. southeast, in order to find a job, send home, because in Britain is not like Germany. German people don't buy a house, they hire. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but English people, the first thing when they get married, they mm -hmm. plan to have the child, they have a house. Mm -hmm. They used to. Mortgage. Not anymore, uh, maybe yeah. we can say that. But mortgage and mortgage, they are there. And they establish children's school is there. They, mm -hmm. they can't move. <coughs> anyway, uh, and of course, there was a, a non unionized female workforce there. Mm. America see this opportunity and open lots of plantations for computer um, yeah. parts like our countries most of the time. Uh, what is called the Zimiat Clones Navy? Carpet waving. Look, you can show you about the people made it. Assembly truck. Assembly truck, they say today. And they start to say, Silicon Glen is in the um, north, yeah. is, uh, maybe in Scotland, maybe it's down on the mm. other countries. Uh, because America has the o opportunity to do the mass production only. I mean, England is very good for the batch production, yeah. but not for that. <laughs> it was, I, I, I never really loved it that much. <laughs> this country become like our countries in that sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and earning money. So when we think about the um, neoliberal economy's impact on the um, uh, female workers, it is drastic. Yeah. Because um, the lower wages, naturally the male workers getting lower and lower and lower yeah. wages, yeah. but the female wages was already was no, not only yeah. hundred or hundred years that they, they speak about yeah. they could pay but they did. Yeah. Anyway, this is also in the aspect. Uh, as far as said about uh, the um, Europe why they don't fit stern reference to Europe. I mean that my guessing, my uh, understanding up to today, uh, Britain never uh, respected the Europe. the whole Portland, uh, all the uh, MODs and etc. is on the north towards the, the France, French, for many, many years it continued like that. And when they were going to sign the treaty, uh, Rome, they didn't, and up to the 1992, and they re it, they didn't want to. And can you imagine a country 
if you go get married with a Frenchman, they wouldn't allow you, uh, if you get divorced with etc., to pass your Britishness to your child from the Frenchman. Why did you marry with a barber? Uh, so it was a consideration of Europe, but they always look very sympathetically to America as Anglo-Saxon, and as well as they, they like continuation in each other, because one was the uh, entire force, uh, financial force of the whole countries and the big empire, and now the America take over the finance, and so they feel the link. And uh, always Britain, despite a small country now, uh, is the advisor of America. I wanted to, to, to go on and just say one, one more point mm -hmm. about, about what you mentioned, but yeah. the, the right being success is also a sign that people want change. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's an important point. And people don't just want the right being change, but of course we have the Corbyn moment here in the mm -hmm. UK, mm -hmm. at least until the other election, 6th of June or 8th of June. Mm -hmm. 8th of June. 8th of June, yeah. So until that, we, we have the Corbyn moment, then we see what comes afterwards. But yes. that's correct. I, I think that there is a willingness. And I think you mentioned the parties going down to 6%. It's also because people don't believe that those parties, traditionally the Workers' Party, would deliver a, a, worker, a worker agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes and that's what Corbyn initially managed successfully that he did adopt this kind of more workers perspective and there was some sort of support then for those policies mm -hmm. not like like Ed Miliband is dithering on the one hand we do a bit that but we do a bit this yeah, that, uh, a clear I'm, I'm still convinced a clear anti-austerity message mm -hmm. would get large support in this country yeah. but uh, it's just not coming, and, and even now Corbyn is constrained by the party internal, the divisions to, to, to put this, this strategy forward. But, but you're right, that's important to mention. And, uh, there are also more signs of hope, and, and the fact that there's so much support for those right-wing parties is also a bit the fault of, uh, of those traditional Labour parties and their inability to, to provide this voice for more workers' interests. We have 10 more minutes left. Can we uh, concentrate what on what chances for the left part of the discussion? So more uh, politically, uh, what, what chances have we got for the left, given the circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. If, if I could just make two, three quick responses to other questions raised, and then so, so, if, is that okay? Please. It, it would be unfair otherwise. So. Uh, I think you mentioned with self employment, often bogus self employment, I would say it, it's, that's one of the tendencies where all the risk is put on the employee. If there's no work, we don't call you in, yeah, you're self employed. And that, that's what, what is so difficult to organize. But perhaps with Uber and, and other instances, there are possibilities and very often we are frustrated with our bureaucratic trade unions. You mentioned from the 80s, it's a very similar situation today, yeah? but perhaps there are new trade, new type of trade unions which can much more actively respond to that. But you're right, that that's, that's one of the big, big, big challenges. Why the US experience? Why don't we draw on, on others? It is quite fascinating actually, but the US labor movement is so weak, but the representatives are still very confident when they speak about their organizing successes. And so <laughs> I also think we, we need to look to, to, I mean, there's something to learn of organizing. I think the British unions, not just because they feel more Anglo Saxon, look at them, but they also, there is this, especially in bureaucratic trade union apparatuses, there's this worry, of course, the more members you lose. You suddenly can no longer finance your apparatus. I've been for two years at the National Executive Committee of my union, University and College Union. It was a very disillusioning experience, I have to say. But that, that, that was put out by the General Secretary of the National Executive Committee. He said, look, if we lose more members, then we have to make people unemployed in the bureaucratic apparatus. And so I think because the US, they are so strong in organizing, in 
recruiting members often without vision or so. That's perhaps why they, they may look so so much to that. And then who taught? I think Ali was it you about unpaid internships and work mm -hmm. for experiences. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the big issues. I've actually got a PhD student who's about to finish, and she she's done work. She lives in London actually, on boycott work, boycott workfare groups who try to organise against that. And she's been an activist herself in against unpaid internships. Yeah, even war on war, and she's a kind of a model NGO. Absolutely. Had uh, <laughs> unpaid internships, and she was mobilising against that. Like she, she could be somebody for an interesting presentation one day of organizing precisely against these kind of forms of very novel exploitation yeah, where people are supposed to get first experience with perhaps the chance of getting a job but actually all their work what companies do is they replace proper jobs with this kind of unpaid experience jobs and, and, and that, that's, that, that's the problematic. Sorry, but now I'm going to, yeah, uh, I, I, I am going to ask just one question. Uh, now, our organization, MR, yeah. we established this just to find contacts uh, with the people who are studying in, in and around the topics of working yeah. class. So, uh, my question is this, uh, since uh, you are uh, writing and elaborating about the working class conditions. Are you uh, creating some sort of a pool for PhD students yeah. who are focusing on working class issues yeah. so that anybody who can be, for example, uh, recommend mm -hmm. that anybody who is writing in and around the issues mm -hmm can contact yeah. your uh, yeah. uh, your university, your department. Yeah. So I've, I've got a range of PhD students, like the one yeah. who works on, on these kind of unpaid internships yeah. and work, work first schemes. Yeah. Of course, to get funding, that, that, that's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you work on financial markets, there's more funding available than if you work on, on trade union organizing that student I mentioned there, she gets a scholarship from the German Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, mm. which is the, the foundation affiliated to the left party in Germany. So there is some funding, yeah? but I've, I've got a whole range of PhD students who would look at, at trade union issues also. Yeah, that, 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 that's correct. Ruskin College shuts down. Yeah. Masters is, and PhD. I mean, the reality is to study trade union is not a fashionable topic, yes. despite us being here. Yeah, it's not a fashionable topic, and it's also not a topic where there's massive funding available. That doesn't mean one shouldn't do it. Yeah, it has to be, that's not good. But I think in practice, this kind of trade union studies is, is not, I think it's absolutely key. It's, it's essential. Yeah. But sorry, you wanted to come, what are the chances for yeah. the left? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, so. um, it is open to everybody. Mm. Whatever you will say about the chances of the left for the future. Now you are talking about the left. Well, uh, for example, if you are calling the Labour Party or no. Social Democrats in Turkey, I don't call them left. Because they are trying to find solution in this very system, capitalist system. At the end of the day, they cannot get out of this frame. frame you know? <laughs> and they are hitting and coming back. When they are moving forward, many young people, many uh, old leftists behind all them, but when did, uh, but always they, when they come to break, a uh, breaking point, they are just cannot go, cannot get further, cannot go forward. Even Jeremy Corbyn, when the time comes, he has to uh, on backwards. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's causing very serious uh, disappointment.
uh, among the young people, among enthusiastic new socialists. And uh, so uh, we need to organize, but we cannot organize openly. Like, even Turkey cannot organize openly. If you are going to uh, open an uh, association or something like that, you need to get the tens of uh, uh, documents, papers from police, from uh, uh, the local judges and everything you see. But in here you can organize, but you cannot uh, improve. As soon as uh, they see you improving, they try to buy you first. First they uh, underestimate you uh, in front of the people, people, this type of uh, propaganda. Then try to buy you, then try to smash you. This is <laughs> three level of... <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah. So that's why you need to organize under the world, under the ground. You see, there is no uh, other way, in my opinion. You open, when you, whenever you openly organize, even when you organize, you you need to be digital, you know, website or something like that. And you, you can say good things in the website, and the you know the advertisement companies start offering money to you if you get one thousand ticks. I pay as much if you put my uh, yeah, advertisement over there. But it's the kind of world we are living in. It, it's hard to uh, organize, uh, organize properly, you know, the principally. Uh, yeah, otherwise, if you cannot target exactly, you cannot move forward. And if you a little bit move your uh, <laughs> your weapon, and you cannot hit the target. You know, you need you need to be very careful what you are talking about. Where are you going uh, to achieve at the end of the day? But when the time comes to achieve this target, as I said before, uh, <laughs> unknown forces <laughs> uh, smashing your movement. But again, we need to organize so-called integrity. <laughs> There is no other way to open it. Organizing is not the solution, in my opinion. I think there is some political person behind the movement. Otherwise, it's not going to forward. For example, Tony Benn, mm -hmm. Arthur Scarbia. They have got a good leadership. Mm -hmm. And the working people is going behind them. But now, a few people only going behind the leaders. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, global capitalist system is manipulating everything in the world. <coughs> because uh, uh, they had been made a law, they had been made a frame, you can't go other side. Mm. And this frame is only inside their laws. Mm. And trade union can't go be behind, yeah. behind to them. Yeah. Everything is their hand in the world. And only the people is educated well and gives some idea and if there is any uh, economical crisis all over the world or England or somewhere else and uh, this time uh, there is a new leaders come front of the, uh, this uh, organization and make something otherwise uh, uh, they have got a profit. Also, the li li leaders are, can be spendable, you see. Yeah. They want leaders not organized. Not organized. Movement. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, young leaders of uh, Turkish uh, left mo movement, Deniz Gezmiş and others, they still make it public stories. Yeah. Even uh, capitalist newspapers are still talking about it. They want individuals come out to the uh, uh, and they, they, they grab them, break it to show uh, masses of working people in the moment, look, we are breaking your leaders, we are killing your leaders, yes. uh, just like that. Who are you? Yes. And so we need, we need to uh, educate new, new uh, not individuals, but group of people. Group of people. Kadro, ne diyor diye. Yeah, in my opinion, superman, uh, supermans or superwomans 
cannot change things. Yeah. If we are going to change it, if we are educated, right. can, yeah. can. can I just mention, if you permit, uh, one thing. We have attended a uh, union meeting where uh, Professor Andreas was lecturing and uh, I happened to ask some questions to the uh, rostrum. Mm -hmm. Without waiting the answer from him and the other speakers, the woman uh, unionist behind me said, Marxist, Marxist, stop him. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> they, 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 did, they did say that. Yeah. It is not what, uh, what the answer from uh, the rostrum, it is just behind me. Marxist, Marxist, they say. This is. This happens not a, in a union meeting where members are. This is a scientific, academical meeting where union leaders and academicians should be free to discuss anything yeah. under the uh, sky, yeah. right? Yeah. So this shows where we are. Please. Well, um, I think one of the, or another, sign of hope is the fact that the um, the working class continues to struggle and continues to rise up and you have you know so many examples like egypt um all, all these places where revolutions take place and but what you also need is is the revolutionary party you need the ideas to take things forward and that's why you know many revolutions have failed but but they will keep going until you know until it does change because this system has got to change because so many young people, in particular, recognise that it's broken. And that's why you're getting all these strange election results, because people are saying, it's not working, I want something different. And they are trying. And when that fails as well, then they will start looking at socialist solutions if they haven't already. Any one better ones in the future? In the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? You have the last question, and Not he question, will have the last, I about the word, last, last word. Um, sure. I think when we are thinking about what needs to be done, part of it needs to be international, because capital is everywhere, organizing itself on an international level. But at the same time, concentration of centralization of capital is happening. Mm -hmm. And that makes the states more authoritarian, not in a sense that they, how can I say, there is a crux of the matter is on the state, I mean, as far as I know. Because previous era, everybody think that the state is the referee will uh, sort it out and mm -hmm. we have to go and speak to yeah, that yeah. and then say, lawfully, lawfully, it needs to be lawfully. Sorry. <laughs> And now, we are in, in this situation this, we need to show. Something happening inside all the Something inside. To open it carefully. No. No. Later on, later on, when we finish. When the, 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 when the state actually understood by the people that it is not a referee, it can move. Mm. According to the capitalist nature, character, etc., yeah. and takes the law as as the part of it. It's not a part of the working class struggle. Mm. And the state also should be um, completely. People start to understand that we don't need state. We don't need this kind of uh, establishment. Gradually, this needs to be accepted. For example, when the new uh, movement in Turkey happened, uh, several years, not, um, I mean, a couple of years ago, I, there was a meeting in the uh, Crystal Park, very near here, uh, and uh, one guy was uh, probably the uh, leftist movement, wants to make a speech. And then there was young, young, young girls and young, young boys were sitting on the, on the uh, grass. Mm -hmm. 
and they were talking, and uh, there was no applause, and no uh, yes and no, no shouting, mm -hmm. etc. It's a new method of mm -hmm. understanding, like saying this and saying that, all those sort of things. And then young girl said, turned like that, and, and said to the guy, "Oh, I think he's going to be the next MP or something." Mm -hmm. And of course, he's very offended, but he didn't say anything mm -hmm. because there are quite a number of people. I think these are important because we made mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes. We kept these hierarchies. We find a space in there. And uh, from there, we yeah, felt very powerful, uh, despised other people. And trade union is exactly the same. For example, you go to trade union meeting, da, 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 past, past. Mm -hmm. And uh, OK, any opposition, yes, no, no, wrong. I, I mean, that is not the way. I've been in the ECOP, uh, Economic and Social Committee in the uh, European um, Commission. Ah, yeah. And I was impressed, I must say, because at least people were coming and they were saying, for example, uh, Sir, my husband is in the prison uh, for such and such years and so, 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 I think these kind of things, whether it is in this structure, whether it's not out of the structure, we need to look at it. And also, anything is from the left or from the alternative or from the against the neoliberal capitalism. We need to look properly, A to Z, what they said, how, which parts were positive, which were not, not positive. How can we bring it out? How can we make it more known? Because so, so many things is happening, 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 but the results is not going yeah. uh, and assimilated enough. I think that is a big problem. Yeah. Last words. Sir. Perhaps I, I think all excellent. I mean, not yet something I would di disagree, but I think what was interesting, what what came out. I mean, this is the question: Are trade unions actually potential agents? I mean, they are good in defending working conditions and demanding higher salaries, but are they actually able to be agents of transformation of the system? And even if we think about this idea of, okay, we need to empower the Chinese workers to have their own trade unions, to have a more level playing field, we would be still, of course, within the capitalist system. It would be better, lots of people would benefit, but I think ultimately for, for drastic change, we would also need to change the way production is organized. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not based on private ownership of the means of production, but on socialized own ownership. And that's the question, yeah, are trade unions the agents which can move towards it? Only the practice probably can, can show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.